Hey everyone, welcome back to part three of topic seven in our database class. In this video, I'm going to discuss several important concepts related to database indexes. So indexes are created on one or more columns is extraordinarily common for indexes to be applied to primary keys. And if you think about it, the reason why is like, how do we join records together in different tables? It's through primary key foreign key links. Okay. So in order to match up one record and or a record in one table with a record in another table, if the primary key column is indexed, I will be able to quickly locate any of the, the records in that table by the primary key value, which is exactly what I need for linking records together. So if I'm doing a join, I can vastly increase the speed of the join by ensuring that the primary key in one table at one end of the relationship is indexed and that the foreign key column at the other end of that relationship is indexed. Okay. So if, for example, if I have, I don't know, an employee table and a department table and the primary key is the department ID for departments, then I would have a foreign key named department ID in my employee table as well. So if that primary key and foreign key are both indexed, then I will be able to very quickly link together employees and departments because I'll be able to find what I want almost instantly with very few search operations. So how do these work? Well, if we index, here's just an example, we create an index on the primary key column. So that index will contain the primary key value as well as a pointer, or you can think of it like a row number, if you want to think of it conceptually like that, back to the underlying data table. Okay. This is what we saw previously here, right? With last names. So the index contains the last name and the pointer to the position, the actual row in the underlying table. Just like the index in a textbook contains the item you're looking for, plus a page number, it tells you where to look. Same thing here. So if we build an index on the primary key, well, we're going to have as part of the index, the primary key values, right? That column will be in there along with a pointer to the underlying row. So as we see here in step three, if we run a SQL select query that involves this primary key, then the database can find the primary key value very quickly by looking in the index. And just like using the index at the back of a textbook, the database will then know precisely where to look within the table to find the underlying row of data. Okay. And as we saw illustrated several times without an index, the DBMS has to perform a table scan in order to locate the row or rows that it's looking for. And a table scan is just this naive search, right? It's just start at the top and I just start looking. I just look from one row to the next, to the next. And if I'm looking for multiple uh, rows, I'll potentially have to scan all the way to the bottom. All right. So that's how these work. Now there are some constraints right? it's not all sunshine and unicorns as they say. Uh, and those constraints involve data types. So any sort of column that has what's called a large object data type cannot be indexed directly. We do have some additional sneaky things that we could do to index them, such as using a hashing algorithm. I'll illustrate that here a little later in this, in this topic, but basically we can't index these large objects just by the virtue of the fact that they're large. Okay. So uh, some of the large text, or I should say the large object data types in SQL server include things like text, right? Cause this can hold something like 2 billion characters of text. Imagine trying to sort that alphabetically. Like it's going to take a long time to do the sort. It's also going to take a long time to do comparisons, right? N text is the same way. The N just tells us that this is Unicode. So it's going to take up even twice as much storage space, right? Images, right? There's an image data type, a large object data type. So we can't build an index directly on images. We would have to use some other technique, right? Other large object data types, Vercare. And Vercare, if it's set to max, right? Because these are billions of possible characters. Ver binary, 
right? This is a, a data type that we can use for storing binary data directly in our database. So for example, I don't know if we had some videos, we could store those directly in the database in the form of binary data. And uh, there's actually one additional one in SQL Server that's not listed here. SQL Server also has a native XML extensible markup language data type, and that is also considered a large object data type. So we can't build indexes on a column if the column has an XML data type either. So again, the idea here is that these are just, they can hold big data and where, and what I mean in this case is like each item, each datum, each item of data can potentially be very, we're storing videos in there. It could be a couple of gigabytes per video. So it makes sense that we can't really build an index on that. It's not going to be efficient to try to sort those things. Do remember that we don't get this increase in performance for free. We have to pay for it. Right. And there's no free lunch, <laughs> as they say. And in this case, our payment is in the form of extra storage space. Okay. So whenever we have an index in place, regardless of what type of index it is, it means that our database table will consume more storage space than it did previously, because we need to have somewhere to store the information about the index. So we saw here in this previous example. Uh, this is our underlying data table, and maybe it has some additional columns, first name, email address, phone number, et cetera, for our employees. And maybe this is our index. So we built this index on the last name column, but we have to store this, right? So I have to store this sorted list of last names along with their row pointers. And that takes up storage space. Okay. So again, it's just like the index at the back of a textbook. If I want to have that as a benefit to me, so I can find what I want quickly. I have to pay for it by adding a few extra pages to the length of the book. Same idea here, right? If I want to have the benefits of indexes and databases, I have to pay for it by consuming a little more storage space. So how much storage space? Well, it depends. <laughs> and uh, we can get a rough estimate of how much additional storage space is required, just taking the product of the number of rows in the table and the average number of additional bytes required per row to have our index columns. So for example, if we were looking at this situation, we would say, okay, we've got 22 rows of data in this table. And as a rough estimate, we could say, what do we think is the average amount of characters per last name? It's probably something around, what would you guess, six? <laughs> if you looked at those. I don't know exactly, but I would guess it's probably somewhere around six is probably a good, good guess at the average. So if we're, if we can store, if we're using like, like an ASCII character set, we can store one character per byte. So that would require an average of say six bytes per row. We multiply that by the 22 rows and we get 132 additional bytes of data required to have this index. So that's our expense. And yeah, we might have to figure in the row pointers as well, but as a rough guideline, it works. So we can scale it out. We can see how it adds some notable storage requirements to databases once you start to have lots and lots of rows. So uh, let's assume that in this scenario, we build an index on a last name column and a department ID column. So in this case, we have an index on two separate columns and our last name, our last names require an average of 16 bytes per row. And our department IDs require an average of two bytes per row. For example, if we used a short integer, like a 16 bit integer. So if we have 98,000 rows of data in our table, we could estimate the additional storage space requirements by taking 98,000 rows and multiplying that by eight, 16 bytes for the last names and additional two bytes for the department IDs. And we see we get around an additional say 1.7 megabytes of data of storage space required. So in this case, the index takes up an additional 1.7 megabytes. Not a huge deal, but again, you know, you scale this up to the range of billions of rows of data and it can, it can definitely consume a lot of extra storage space, particularly if you are indexing like columns that contain characters or text in them, or if you have lots of columns indexed in a table. So I think there's just one more thing I want to mention today.
So, and that is the notion of having to rebuild the index. What I have here is the index on the left and the actual table on the right. So we know that one of the things that we can do is that we can add or delete rows of data to our tables. So let's imagine that we have this actual table of data here on the right, and we're going to add a new row. Okay, so we'll be adding a new row here. As it's just, hey, it's the next row in the table, right? So we're going to add another one there. And let's say that, I don't know, we put in row number 23. And because I'm lazy, I'll make this person have the last name of Wu. So I only have to write two letters, right? So we've added a row of data to our table, but we're not finished. We have this index over here and uh, we've got to find and insert this new row of data into our index as well. Now, in this case, we know that it's alphabetized. So I should have chosen a different last name, but uh, what will happen is we'll ultimately end up inserting a new row in the index over here at 23 and put in woo as well. So by adding the row here, I also have to figure out where that new item should go in the index and add it to the index over here. Okay, so I have to update the index. And let's choose something a little, maybe it's me. I'll put my last name in here. So instead of Wu, we'll put in my last name. Very far, but we'll live with it. So we add a new row and that has to trigger an update in the index. So we have to say, okay, where is this person going to go? We can use our same binary search strategy to find where this new row needs to be inserted. And if we did that, we would find it's going to go right in here, right? Between these two. Okay. So basically I need to take all of these rows. Oops, that was, I have to grab all of these rows here and uh, basically move them down one so that I can insert a new row and put our new person in there. Because if I allow this index to become out of date, then it's worthless to me for finding what I need, right? So whenever a change occurs in the underlying table, that is in this case, like if the, the indexed column is last name. So if a last name is updated, added, or deleted, then that's going to cause some additional work over here on the index table, because I need to keep the index up to date. Okay. So this is additional computational work that comes along with having an index. We don't just build it once, right? We have to constantly modify it if our tables are modified. So this is why, as a general rule, if you have a very heavily updated table, that is changes are being made all the time, you want to have a very sort of minimal conservative indexing strategy because if we have lots and lots of indexes and that table is undergoing lots and lots of changes or updates, then we'll have to spend a lot of time rebuilding the index or indexes if there are several of them. And that may actually end up hurting the database's overall performance. Right? So if I have 10 columns in a table index, and every time I make a change, I have to update 10 different indexes. That's going to require a lot of computational work. So whatever performance gains I'm getting from the index may be offset by the additional work that the database has to do in order to keep those indexes up to date. It would be like if you had a textbook and you're constantly adding new information to it. So whenever you add new information, you've got to go into the index in the back of the book and update things and be like, nope, this is no longer located on page 723. It's now on page 724 and something else is in page 723. <laughs> so. That's, so you can imagine it's a lot of work. So indexes tend to work best in situations where tables are updated relatively infrequently. In those situations, feel free to, to index to achieve whatever sort of level of performance you want. But if tables are updated a lot, you have to think very carefully about the additional computational overhead of having to continuously rebuild the index and make the decision of whether it's worthwhile.